did uh, a class that, that Dick came to um, here um, on campus, and we thought, wow, that was a really neat presentation, just because he has the perspective of um, being a contract inspector and then also has some previous background experience. He's going to talk to you today about the organic pasture rule, basics of it. You may already know these, but I'm hoping he's going to tell us some, some stories about his visits to farms and how um, things he's come across that were either done really well or not done so well from an inspector's perspective. Um, and so once again, he's not a direct employee of, of uh, OSA, but contract inspector and lives near Madison. So welcome, Bill, and we have a handout. Yep. Go for yeah, it. If you don't have that handout, please, please get one. Uh, and of course, I'll drag you back just a couple of pages here to get some perspective. If you go back to the page that has a bottom that looks like this, there's a polar gray pasture down here. Um, that's like the back of the second piece of paper. This is what I saw on organic farms when I started inspecting in 2007. It's very typical of what I saw on organic farms in 2007. The rule at that time was access to the outdoors, period. Now, there are people that were grazing more effectively. There were people that were, uh, were looking to best utilize the activity and capabilities of their livestock to produce milk on dairy farms. But many of the dairy farms I visited were like this. And one of the problems associated with this, from my perspective, just as a, I grew up on a dairy farm, my perspective is that you've got three major issues here, right? You're not getting feed intake that you need to produce uh, organic milk from those pastures, right? You have environmental issues here, obviously broken down pastures, run down stream banks, ponds, and a large opportunity for runoff and in the Madison area, they, they're always squealing about phosphorus in our lakes and it's runoff from dairy operations upstream. We talk about zero phosphorus fertilizers on lawns and all those sorts of things. It's not the issue. It's dairy farm runoff from overgrazed pasturing and or overfertilized soils. As an agronomist and a soil scientist, I know that not only from my training but from experiences over the years. Nadia mentioned that I was a, uh, a senior auditor in, in uh, the class she and Dick taught. It was an eye-opener for me because as, as, a, uh, as an inspector, we're, we're told and we're, and we're taught how to go out and sort of subjectively and hopefully a bit more objectively measure pasture capabilities because there is this pasture rule in mechanics um, that I'll get into a full discussion on today. Uh, but if you don't know it, if you're over 60 years old, you can go to the University of Wisconsin for free. <laughs> and so that's how I got in. My sixth semester uh, now, and it's been really enlightening. I work with, uh, I go to the agroecology seminar programs, that's where I met Ruth. Um, and it's been a very, very good experience. So if you have an opportunity, uh, if you're near the area or have the ability to access the university, I would strongly suggest it. You have to be over 60 to go over the state system does as well. And some even some of the technical programs have that. I know. There's several, there's several inspectors in the room and people who've been inspectors like Joe. Um, take a look around this room. What do you see? Some good looking people. No, no, no. <laughs> look at the walls. Look at the pile and the pillars. <laughs> yeah, covered up to a certain When I walked in here, I saw that treated wood right away, and I thought, okay, how is he preventing access to that treated wood? Don't worry, some of us pointed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of us pointed it out. Yeah. He's got metal on here. It's the first time I've actually seen metal on here. That's pretty good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, and I can see that these areas are not areas that have cattle access, so they aren't in contact with that. Uh, uh, but those are some little things that you, as an inspector, right away when I walk in, I'm like, looking for treated wood. Right? <laughs> so the inspectors can recognize it. Inspectors can also recognize the value of pasturing and the pasture rule. As I said earlier, if you look at that photograph, that's what I saw on organic farms in Wisconsin. The landscape has changed. This pasture rule came into effect uh, in 2011. 
And the, path, the landscape in Wisconsin has changed, particularly on, well, obviously on organic farms, where the home farm typically becomes grazing, and the rental ground is where they grow the crops. And, uh, and that has changed the landscape. So there's three, three main reasons for this organic pasture rule, and one of them is to get animals to eat feed, okay, at least 30% of their dry matter off of their own grazing capabilities, at least 30% of their own grazing capabilities. What are these animals made for? Are they made to stand here and us bring feed to them at a cost of diesel fuel, at a cost to the environment? No. All right? They're made to go graze, and they're efficient and effective at it. Number two, uh, environmental impacts, as I mentioned earlier, the stream bank erosion, the outwash of phosphorus fertilizer. All of the other things associated with dairy farming practices uh, that are a problem. And number three, uh, parasites. And we ever think about that? These, these intensively managed or intensively grazed, overgrazed facilities, they're just passing parasites from one animal to the next. Vocational grazing, one of its objectives is to reduce the parasite load that goes back into the animal system. So it's a means of biological control, in a sense, of what is happening uh, in those paths and pastures. I'll try to get back onto the, onto the, uh, the presentation I did by you, but I have a few, a few opinions that I'd just like to venture out. Uh, and and uh, Nadia mentioned it earlier this morning, I have a real bugaboo, a real stick in my whatever, about heifers. I go out to so many dairy farms. And I'll see nice rotational grazing programs for the milking cow. That's where the economic return to the farm is, right? So that's where we focus. But the economic return to the future farm is in the heifers. And they're all too often sort of ditched over there on that little four acre paddock down under by the trees, or, and it's like overgrazed, and it looks like the photograph that I provided you with today. So too often to see that, and we hold people to the standard on those livestock as well. All right. So well, if I were your inspector, I would be making you know not in this case, but if I saw that situation where they're off in the ditch, where the old dump site was, right, or whatever, there's a few old washing machines down there, and there's a few efforts. They are not being raised optimally. They are not going to gain as they need to. Their structures are not going to be what they could be. And the rumen function is not going to be what it could be over the long term of that animal on the farm. And I would guess you might even experience reproductive problems if they're not fed properly. But too often they're neglected. Dry cows are often the same situation. Dry cows might be a little bit different because they've already developed those systems and they have and work them when they are milking. Um, but off, all too often you see those heifers just uh, neglected. Treat it as though they aren't an economic value to that farm. One little bugaboo. Um, another one is pastures are crops. Pastures are crops. They need to be managed like a crop. They need to be thought of like a crop. We need to look at soil testing pastures. When I go to an organic farm, I never find a soil test on a pasture. Never. That's to the farm. Why? I don't quite understand because we need to understand the fertility and how we can manage those pastures uh, uh, with proper fertility. And it's not just to drop into the manures, but there may be other reasons, there may be other inputs that could cause a response that would have an economic value, again, not only to the milking animals, uh, but to the, um, but to the, you know, just the overall health of the whole herd. And the other thing I want to talk about relative to the pasture rule, which I hope you get into a little more detail on, is the pasture rule is not a penalty for being an organic farmer. Did you hear that, man? So often when we go out and do an inspection, this is the time when we start talking about the dry matter intake. It's like, this is the penalty period that the farmer sits through, struggles through. Am I right, Liz? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the Code of Federal Regulations, this is the National Organic Standard. And I took a, took a little bit out of it because I didn't want to have all the numbers in there. But to annually provide a minimum of 30% of the room's dry matter intake 
on average, and I underlined on average, and we'll get back to that before the end of the conversation. On average, over the course of the grazing season or seasons, now in Wisconsin we pretty much have a season. Some years we have seasons, <coughs> depending on the droughty periods in July, August. To minimize the occurrence and spread of diseases and parasites and to refrain from putting soil and water quality at risk. That's actually written in the Code of Federal Regulations. To take that a little bit further, uh, after practice, the standard is to be considered organic under the standards, ruminants must receive that, I've already said that, for a minimum of 120 days. This includes dairy calf over six months of age. Confinement under six months of age is acceptable because there are, there are reasons for why you do that, bottle feeding or nursing, uh, but also just getting the animal transitioned to pasturing uh, can be very important. But the standard is six months or over. So as an inspector, again, inspector's perspective, I, I look at animals and I look at the tags and I ask the farmer to show me a date of birth on a, on a sampling of tags that I see in a pen, like right here today, if they were here. So why aren't these animals on pasture? Because they are over six months of age. Now you need to justify that to me. And of course they can't. And so they, they, they tell you, well, I, get, I, I need to move them out or I just haven't had time or whatever the reason might be. Um, but they, they'll come up with a reason, typically. So grain-finished ruminant stock uh, can be on pasture and not have received 30%. If they're in that finishing period, which as an inspector, I'm looking for documentation. When did that animal or those group of animals go into the finishing period where you're feeding them a higher concentration of carbohydrates or, or whatever? Um, and they must provide sufficient information or documentation to us about that. And it must be a part of their organic systems plan. Those of you who aren't organic farmers or haven't done inspections may not understand that a farmer needs to turn into their certifier each year an organic systems plan. And that is how I am going to farm this year. This is what I am going to do. And that also includes some auxiliary documents like the crop management plan, uh, what areas are pastures, what areas are fields and cultivated and not cultivated, crops for sale and so forth. It also includes um, uh, their list of animals uh, in the case of the livestock organic systems plan. It includes the inputs they intend to use on the farm or with the livestock and a variety of other things. That system plan is reviewed by the certifier. And the certifier should be sending an inspector out to verify what the farmer said he's doing is what he's doing. By the time that review is done, we wouldn't be sent out to inspect a farm that the certifier suspected is not an organic farmer by his practices, right? Um, so we go out to review those farms that they suspect are organic farmers by their practices. That's an important distinction. So the inspection is a verification. Just the other day, the first time I used a political statement with a farm in the West, I said, do you remember Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev? And he was old enough to remember Reagan and Gorbachev. I said, trust, but verify. Do you remember that term? Does anybody here remember that term? You guys are old enough to remember that. Trust, but verify. And that's what the organic inspection process is all about. And that's really true with the pasture standard as well. As an inspector, I'd love to be able to spend two and a half to three hours in the pasture evaluating their content and their quality and their composition. I don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. I'll just say, having gone through quite a few you know, inspections on our farm, that's, it's just not, not enough time to spend on pasture or education. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think it's, it's yeah. a vital point that should be. Well, the certification process is, is really, uh, and as an independent inspector, I, I should be an impartial third party just looking and writing down things and reporting back to the agency. But again, as a, as a past extension educator and educator, I can help myself. Right. But sort of spread information farm to farm or spread information that I, from my knowledge of, of uh, the pasture standards. There are, within the pasture standard, there are these various, uh, I guess I'll call them scopes. So we need, to, we need to, uh, types of pasture to ensure that the feed requirements of the livestock feed standard are being met. 
these are things that we try to evaluate at least subjectively on a farm, maybe objectively as much as possible. Are the cultural and management practices used to ensure the pasture is sufficient quality and quantity? All right. On average, again, is a part of that statement and not less than 30%. As an inspector, I'm looking at the grazing seasons and it's dependent somewhat on the region. And remember that when I get back to that on average statement, I'm, I'm going to try to explain something to you you may or may not agree with later on. But I've discovered this in the last year myself about that term on average. The grazing season for livestock operations in the local region. The location and size of the pastures, we got to have maps. We, as part of the inspection process, we do review the maps with the grower to compare them to their uh, organic systems plan or their your crop plan, we call it at MOSA, um, and, and make sure that the acreages make sense. In fact, that there is that money, much acreage, that the fencing is available, that that is actually being pastured. Um, and what kind of oversight the animals have. I've been on many farms where there's a 25-mile drive to a pasture where the heifers are dropped in the spring and picked up in the fall. And I, I really wonder about you know, organic management. Um, and, and literally, there may be a half a dozen visits or in a couple of bales of hay if it gets droughty that are dropped out there. So they're kind of on their own. Um, and, uh, and that becomes a little bit of an issue as an inspector as well. The types of grazing methods used, obviously on this grass bed farm, rotational grazing uh, is near and dear to any inspector's um, uh, experiences. When I go to a grass fed farm, I'm so happy to be there. You know, you can't tell me how, uh, I, I, mean, can't tell you, I can't tell you how happy I am because it makes the inspection process so much simpler. Fewer inputs, you're not doing um, analysis on quantities of uh, 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 harvested uh, corn silage or high moisture corn in a bin, where the grains are being stored, where they're being bought from. Almost never do you find on a grass fed farm bought hay. I don't know. Kevin, if you have to buy any hay in at all. But you, you, you rarely find purchased hay on a grass-fed farm, but maybe it's a matter of one the area and availability. Yeah, we'll have time for, for comments from the organic farmers in the room, don't worry. He's got some time. Other people? Yeah, I've got time for questions. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, look at some of the comments. So. But you have to have a soil fertility and, and uh, management system erosion control and protection of wetlands. We do evaluate for that. It's a part of our reporting. Do we see stream banks that are being run down? Uh, is there a lot of gully washing down the lanes? Um, I'll report on those kinds of things. And if there's ponds that are overtread or overworked, um, and if there is water availability, uh, key. Sometimes uh, the water is a quarter mile away, but it is available. Okay. And the other thing that, that I'm not sure the standards actually address as well enough, but but as a as a knowledgeable inspector, I, I evaluate um, you know if they are on a pasture that is providing 30% moisture. That's a lot of moisture going into the. Um, I mean, 30% dry matter. You got 70% moisture going into yeah. that rumen. I, I don't get as concerned about availability of water. It still has to be accessible, but a little further away is a little you know a little less concerning. And you've got a nice water opportunity like this. If you're on a golf course grazing with nothing but thistles standing taller than an inch or two, um, then I get concerned about access to water availability, and particularly in some of those heifer pastures. And uh, water quality as well. And tell you how many times I've had a farmer dump over a tank while I stood and watched because there was a green mat on the top of the water that the cattle were not going to get in. Um, so make sure the water quality is there as well, and that water is managed. Um, a few minutes, no okay. Um, just a few other, a few other um, uh, things to discuss. So why is so? Why do we have this pasture practice standard? I've mentioned that already a few times, um, and particularly, um, there's concern about large western dairies. And those of you who are inspectors, every other, if not every inspection, Western dairies are brought into the conversation. Why are you holding me to these record-keeping standards when, in fact, 
You know, they're out there cheating. Right? My first response to a farmer is, oh, let's come back to your farm and let's concern ourselves with your meeting the standards. What they're doing out there is, has really not a whole lot to do with what's going on in your Wisconsin farm. But there's, I, I believe, uh, and I don't throw any stones or rotten apples or anything, but I believe there's a loophole in the standard that allows for what's happening. I want you to think about that a little bit. The term I said earlier, on average, is used a, a couple of times within the standards. So, in Wisconsin, when we inspect, we think of 120 days per class of livestock, 30% or more dry match. Okay, most of the farms I go to, they're 30 to 50 to 80 percent. It depends on where you are. Dry matter from, from grazing. And depends on the class of livestock. So we think of it that way as classes of livestock. I think what's happening in the West, because the certifier has been evaluated by the USDA. The USDA said the certifier did it correctly. Um, certifier, in at least one case, is the state of Colorado itself in making the decision that this farm is certifiable. They've evaluated the inspector and found the inspector to be following the rule and the process correctly. So how does, how does this happen if you've got 12,000 cows milking and there's no way they're getting out eight miles a day to get forages that they need from pasture? The loophole is this term on average. And I think if you have the right kind of data management for even by cow, perhaps, you can come up with a 30% average. Imagine if you've got 1,000 cows on 15% dry matter intake. And you've got 500 heifers on 60 to 70% dry matter intake. You can do the calculations, and on average, your ruminant herd is getting 30% more dry matter. And we don't like it because that's not the way we farm in Wisconsin. But I think that may be the explanation as to why these Western dairies are getting away with what they're getting away with. And that's the worst effect in the supply. Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions on that? I don't know if that's that hot right. topic. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think that I couldn't. Um, well, most of us audited this year, and we had some opportunities. And um, I went to the ACA and NLP training this year, and had some opportunities to talk to our auditors and know the um, some of the folks who are involved with the Aurora Dairy. Um, audit and I do think it is close it's not a herd average but no but I but I also think that um, some of those larger operations have very precise record keeping systems that do allow them um, to be on the margin in such a way that is auditable like at 30 percent at, at compliance yeah. um, in a way that is audible on average during the grazing season. I would think each, it's hard to do individual records, but at least the way most of us at it, um, and I, as far as you can tell, this is the way our NLP auditors look at it, that every class of animal needs to have an average of 30%. And I think the goal there is that every animal has an average of 30%. You know, are we gonna ask people to keep records on every animal? Well, that would probably be overly burdensome, but it's hard, it's hard because they're in dry areas, they're doing night grazing, they're doing irrigated pastures, they're doing many, many groups, right. um, they're milking, you know, the whole 24 hours. Um, so as far as I know, not being involved, if they have the records to show compliance, which is a minimum record. Yeah, and I want to make sure too if there's any other comments from any of the organic farmers in the room about anything that Bill said. We do have about 10 minutes or so, so I know there are a lot of people who look like they want to say something. So, anything yeah, if you want to say something or ask a question, yeah, challenge this, me on this something. is a good topic. To that's a good point, though, but that's something I'd sort of I'd like to be just make one thing. Turn up, if the term on average wasn't in that language, uh -huh. then you'd definitely be nailed to the class. Uh, the organic Valley is a marketing cooperative. We have a, a pasture policy in place for all our dairy members, and they all have to meet it by class. So yep. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Huh. Yep. We do not go by the herd. We right. go by each specific class of ruminants over six months of the year. So. Yeah.
Okay, good. good. Then I'm clarifying on that. Other, other questions or comments? Bill, can you speak briefly how we as inspectors uh, calculate pasture based on addition by subtraction, not by what a, a nutritionist would do? Yeah, that was brought up in our little group in the field as well. Alfred brought that up. So, so basically, you determine how much that size of animal or the ounce of milk that they produce on average in, on average in the milking cows, for example. And you may determine that they need 25 to 55 or 70 percent, excuse me, pounds of dry matter intake depending on their production. And let's just take the number 40 that I'll produce in the field. So they need 40 pounds of dry matter intake in a given day. Right? Well, you don't tail them around and determine how much each one eats or, or as a group eats. What you do is you determine how much material is fed. Okay, so many dairy farmers, grass fed is different. But many dairy farmers will feed hay, corn silage, some form of concentrate, soybean meal, other materials. And we'll do a pasture calculation, we'll do a, 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 excuse me, an intake calculation, ration calculation, um, and then by subtraction, obviously if they're producing 45 pounds of milk and they need 35 pounds of dry matter intake to do that, and you're feeding them 20 pounds, Okay? You've got 15 pounds that's coming from pasture. It has to come from somewhere. It's coming from pasture. And that's kind of what we use as, as inspectors. And that, that spreadsheet that MOSA provides, or maybe it's a university provision, anyway, we use it in the field. I use it in the field with growers. We'll actually enter their, their ration in, and it automatically calculates down to that 30% plus for them. So they can actually have an educational experience and I'll provide those that have computers, I'll provide them with that software so that they can do that themselves as well. Is that university developed now yet? I don't know. It's You've most got a, there's a sheet that's passed most passed most of them, I believe. Most of them. Yeah. As was the average chart on their ration. That one right here, yeah. 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 This calculation tool is, is really excellent uh, to work with the farmers on because then it was like the farmer I was at the other day, he thought he had 50 percent drive or anything. We went through his calculations, and no, he wasn't making 30. He just speculated he had 50 because they were out there for so long. <laughs> and it also depends, of course, on what else you're feeding them. Right. And he, 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 kept him, he kept him in at night. You know? So yeah. it's like, I don't, I don't think you're going to be making that week. All that feed given and all this stuff. So we go through that calculation on the farm. <clears throat> what I will say as an inspector, I would love to have more time on the pasture. There's so many other things we have to do. We do a crop inspection, we look through the record keeping, the herd health record keeping, the milk and sales volumes and, and dollars. We have so many things that we have to cover in an inspection process. We don't have enough time on the pasture, but I think one of the most important components of, uh, of the inspection experience, let's call it, on the farm. And again, I, don't, I want to make a, uh, for those of you who are farmers, make a strong point. This is not the penalty phase of the inspection period. Um, if you don't meet it, it's reported, and then you deal with us as, as they deal with you. We sure have time for more questions or comments. Here. Yep, right. What are the obstacles to not getting more? Is it because of land availability near the buildings? Is it because of Nadia brought something up earlier? It's a large part is history, history, okay. and, and and the other part is if they're both dairy and cash grain. They look at the value of production on that land. If it's tillable, okay, how much of that tillable land do I want to set aside for my dairy animals? And how much pressure will I put on those heifer grazing areas? All right? Yeah. They're just turned out. They're not anymore. placing the value in that. They're not really evaluating the, the value of that forage going into the building of that calf. Yeah. I think that's a real mistake. I don't know if you run into that, Joe. Yeah, so a bunch of things to look at here. So um, first thing I would say is understanding the value, like you said, I know we have a lot of we have many valley farmers that see the value of growing $10, 1050 corn, right? So they can see that they can capture value there. And so what we need to do as a co-op and the rest of us as a group is to help educate them, uh, these folks to understand what kind of value they could get out of these acres as great. So kudos to people like like Gene and, and Vance and, and everybody that's really been pushing this whole thing, DGA. So we really need to further that message. And I have seen on some Amish communities, uh, some of the bishops are hard to work with when it comes to just hot water. 
Believe it or not, there's some groups that they won't even allow them to put temporary fencing up, and that's a major, major hurdle there. So they're actually forced to putting barbed wires and doing all this, and it's, it is a struggle. I have a group of 13 farms over in, in Central Island that have that problem there. So that could be one of the, but the bigger thing is just getting them to understand what the value they could get by just giving, you know, Kevin mentioned earlier today about giving these paddocks rest. And I'll tell you what, if I was going to give, name one thing that's really been my major bug rules is guys don't understand the value of giving paddocks rest. They just won't let that recover because once they learn that, then they can really start seeing a yield potential, a yield, a yield boost, and then our stocking rates can just go up from there. So think, well, we've got that so, so simple, but yet we lose that. We just do that. Well, it's the idea of treating it like a crop. Yeah. So you treat it like a crop. So you manage your pasture the way you manage your hay field, or the alternative would you manage your hay field the way you're currently managing your pasture. No, you wouldn't. And they'd all say, that'd be stupid. Yeah. So why is what you're doing to your pasture, why isn't that stupid? Would you walk and mow your hay field every three days and expect alfalfa to persist? But that's well, what you're doing when you're grazing. I, I like Kevin's, uh, we, we were talking to Kevin a little bit up in the pasture. He's, he's that's a -Lab. That pasture we were on is cut for hay. So that's, it's an alternative pasture and hay land. And I see that quite a bit on well-managed grass farms like yours, Kevin. Um, I don't see that much on, on other farms where they're feeding a lot of concentrates and or corn silage uh, in their summer rations. We have time for another comment or two. I think the, the biggest thing I, I see is like when they're converting over to grazing, like you said, they want to dedicate the rough area and they want to go to the minimum. So you're talking like, you know, typically like 80 cows on 30 acres and like, can you, can you develop a grazing plan off of that? Well, yeah, it's like if you want to do it, you're going to graze them about two days a week and then, you know, feed them in the barn. If, if you want to consider yourself grazing, because it's hard, it's almost impossible to give a rest and have the right amount of animals per acre density and everything. They just have to dedicate the right amount of land somehow in the first place. I was on a farm this the other day and I had a rough pasture, probably half this pasture, but I would say it was a rough pasture. Right? And it was, he was using this continuous grazing. And, uh, and then he had some managed pasture, beautifully managed pasture, that he's got on a, like an 18 to 19 day rotation. Not enough time, right? 18 to 19 day rotation, but he's loving the results of it. The milk production's up, the sword is good, it looks nice, the cattle are really healthy and well conditioned. I said, well, look at this rough pasture over here. We've got, we've got more land over here than you got in your managed pasture. Cows have access to all these covers are somewhere else. I said, why don't you go into rotational grazing even on that rough pasture? Give this pasture just a few more days. And he's like, the light bulb comes on. All he has to do is run a wire lane down and, and divide it into like five different, six different units. He's all set. He can do. He can use that as an alternative, or maybe as night pasture, to give that other land a little more rest. Cool. Let's get our last comment. There's also an element of it's kind of the elephant in a lot of conversations that's been mentioned here, but the stocking density. That if your land doesn't have the carrying capacity for 100 animals, but you need 100 animals milking to pay your bills, you're in a tough spot. And if you don't have enough money to go get more land, then something has to break. And I see a lot of times where people have overgrazed. And then they start a cycle that just inevitably doesn't benefit them because they haven't considered what is the carrying capacity of their land today. And if they're calculating that they're going to put as many animals as Kevin is, but they've got a golf course with thistle bushes, that's never going to yield them what they want. Right. So I think that is an element of it too that is um, difficult for a lot of people to acknowledge isn't the same for everyone. Go back to um, this one last comment. Yeah. Going back to my original statement, I. I see this, I even provided a couple of photographs in, in, the, uh, in the presentation that would have flowed a little better <laughs> if I'd actually had the PowerPoint. But anyway, um, what, I, what I have seen since the pasture rule implementation is the home farm becomes grazing. And if you look at the successful or large scale Wisconsin organic dairy farms like, like the folks up at Columbus, uh, Miller, 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 Miller and Sons, Miller and Sons. Um, 
you know, the whole home place, plus acres, is it grazing. Uh, the, the Wilsons, the whole farm land that they own is almost all of it is in grazing and they rent their crop ground. And they've got that sort of 36, win 36 month window if they have to transition, often they don't because they're coming onto old pastures or a widow farm or something like that where they have that opportunity to go right into organic cropping. And, and that gives them a lot of flexibility. <coughs> But it keeps the home place all on great. Change the landscape. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thank you.